This presentation this week is on the modern period, which I would be defining as the exploration period up to industrialization and imperialism. So this really takes us from about 1450 up until the 20th century. Uh, this is a really defining moment because the globe is going to change in a massive way. We are now going to see the globe moving away from the dominance of the Middle Kingdom, or China, uh, towards Europe and European industrialization, exploration, and imperialism. And there are so many rich things that come out here for students that are so important. Everything from economic systems to new political forms of organization with the nation state and new reform systems of intellectual beliefs. It's a very rich era and it leads us up to the final part of the class in the 20th century. European exploration. So we kind of know that uh, the reason why Europe was able to take off, and it's actually a huge part of the class, is what we call the Great Divergence, when Europe does take off. But we know a big part of that had to do with Europe's influence from China and the cross-cultural exchanges. Uh, these exchanges took place between the Polo family that went out to uh, do exploration and the Yuan dynasty, which is the Mongol dynasty. Under Kublai Khan, uh, Polo, the Polo family is going to bring back things like the Astrolab, the Triangle Sail, Compass, Printing Press, and Gunpowder. All these things are going to allow Europe to take off. Of course, one of the big questions that we end up with at this time is why Europe did this and why China didn't implement uh, these new technologies that they had created in a way that would allow them to be dominant. Um, one of the big differences that I like to point out is that Europe was a fragmented group of countries. And I always like to tell the students that during the post-classical age, Europe's biggest handicap is that it is fragmented. During the modern age, Europe's greatest uh, strength is that it is fragmented. And the reason why is that this fragmentation creates in the modern area a competition of a new type of social organization called nation states. And that's really going to drive the class from here on out. So this gets us back into these trading relationships. And the most important trading relationships I stress at this time period is the Atlantic trading relationship. This is going to dramatically change what had been a trading relationship of the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean, as Europeans are going to find a way around Africa. Uh, once that happens, trade route competition becomes extremely fierce. Um, like I said, there is a switch that takes place from the Silk Road now to the Atlantic route to India. Uh, this creates a European competition. And the end goal of that European competition is trade routes into China. China, uh, just because China has such a massive population, especially when it comes to trade. Uh, this then becomes the context for the Colombian and uh, for Columbus himself and the Colombian exchange out to the Americas. And what I'd like to stress with this for the students is that I remember in high school trying to learn all these explorers was so hard and trying to memorize it was so hard. But you can put it into this big framework, really, of, of what takes place here. Um, here we have Bartholomew Diaz, Vasco da Gama, and Christopher Columbus in this intense competition. Uh, Diaz and Gama allow for Portugal to find a trade route around the Atlantic into India, and Christopher Columbus comes along and first offers this uh, to his homeland in Italy, uh, but they turn him down. So then he goes to Spain, and Spain is going to see the opportunity to now find another trade route they're hoping to the west that will help them to compete not only um, with the Silk Road, but also with the Ottoman Empire and with Portugal itself. And this is really going to now drive us into this new era. And this new era is the European Scramble. So the European Scramble has multiple phases. Um, I like to say phase one is Portugal and Spain in its competition for Mesoamerica. The second phase, which comes very quickly after this, and probably the more dominant one, is the French and British phase. And that's where we're going to see a move to a more global system uh, once we get to the French and British phase. Uh, the Spanish, I argue, are going to make a huge mistake. And their mistake is uh, they gain the most amount of land and the most amount of wealth, but they take their wealth, silver, and they end up sending it off to Northern Europe and to China and buy a lot of, um, a lot of exports. Uh, I'm sorry, exports from China, as well as sending off money off into Northern Europe. This becomes a huge mistake for them. Britain and France, on the other hand, do an excellent job with their wealth, and what they learn how to do at this time period is invest their wealth into a military. And that military has allowed them to lead mercantile wars that allow them to gain more and more colonies, and that will allow them to expand and to defeat what had been the first phase of the successors of Portugal and Spain. So this brings up the big, uh, big economic theory of the time period that I like to challenge the students with, and it is mercantilism. It was started by a man named Louis Colbert. Now, Louis Colbert, like I, I like to tell the students, Louis Colbert didn't really create mercantilism. Uh, he created the theory of mercantilism. Mercantilism was already taking place by the time he started noticing this. And what mercantilism really is about is about this notion of a balance of trade, that you want to try and create more exports, 
fewer imports, and that the mother country is able to do this by gaining colonies where it can bring back raw resources and then manufacture those resources. This is called mercantilism. So like I said, this was created, the theory was created by Louis Colbert. Mercantilism was about balancing out the trade of exports and imports, and the purpose was to increase the accumulation of national wealth. So you can invest in the military, expand, and get more colonies. If you get more colonies, then you can bring back more raw resources that allows you to manufacture things, and that allows you to continue with this cycle so that you can bring back more wealth to invest in your military. Um, this then brings up this process of colonialism. Um, colonialism uh, at this time period took place amongst the French, the English, and the Spain, Spanish, and they were using their colonies to extract resources for mercantilism. Uh, there were basically three new types of colonies at this time period. New France, which was mainly about trading and military outposts in the Ohio River Valley. There was New England, which was mainly about family settlements on the northeast coast for trade. And there was New Spain, which was mainly about extracting silver from mercantile interest. Now, I also teach AP U.S. history, so I see a lot of crossover here, and this is very important. I try to get this across to the students. New England ended up being the most successful, and what's ironic about that is that at its beginnings, uh, New England had the least amount of land. And so that brings up like a question we ask in class. Why is it that New England with the least amount of land becomes the most successful? And one thing I like to point out to the students is that the English – uh, pursued a policy that ended up being very successful. And the policy was to have families settle permanently uh, within these English colonies that allowed them to establish these settlements that long-term viability and, and stability and allowed them to expand outwards. In the case of New France, they had a huge amount of land, but they were spread out in these military outposts that did not allow them to really retain that land well. In New Spain, their biggest problem was that uh, they went over and conquered uh, the indigenous populations there and then use them for economic extraction. That eventually caused numerous revolts and riots uh, by these people, one of the most famous being one called the Pueblo Revolution. Uh, this created a lot of instability within New Spain and just did not allow them for the kind of stability that the English colonies would have. So uh, we go to Spain, though, with Mesoamerica, and um, in that particular case, um, we do like to talk about this in classes, seeing a huge change that takes place within Mesoamerica as we move from uh, the peoples of the Toltecs, the Olmecs, the Mayans, the Incas, the Aztecs, and now we get into uh, the European domination of the Aztecs. Uh, Hernan Cortes conquers the Aztecs due to their myth of Quetzalcoatl. Um, I like to make a big deal out of this. Usually students will immediately jump to the argument that Hernan Cortes won because he had the better technology. That's absolutely not true. It's also not true that Hernan Cortes had more men than the Aztecs. In fact, the Aztecs had far more people and the technology of that time period really would not have dominated the Aztecs. The reason why we believe the Aztecs were dominated by literally about 300 Spanish going up against millions of Aztecs was because the Aztecs believed in this myth of Quetzalcoatl. They believed in the idea that there had been this god who had been thrown out of the Mexican peninsula who was coming back to save them, and that um, the Aztecs believed that that was Hernan Cortes. They invited him in made allies with him, and then at that point he was able to take them over using some of the local tributary states as well to conquer them. A very similar type of thing happened with Francisco Pizarro, who conquered the Incas in Peru. And the significance is that the Spanish are going to take these conquered peoples and turn them into encomienda systems, where they are used to exploit silver on, long, on large farming plantation called haciendas. It eventually leads to an important debate that I bring up with the students between Juan Sepulveda and Bartolomeo de las Casas on the treatment of natives. Um, Bartolomeo de las Casas was a Catholic monk. He originally held slaves, but when he came to New Spain, he saw how horribly the natives were being treated there and made an argument that this went against Catholic Spanish principles. Juan Sepulveda, on the other hand, made the argument that this was something the Aztecs deserved because of their brutality and because of their lack of rationality. This really leads into a good argument for the kids to have um, at this time period about what was the role of, of the Aztec people within the Spanish Empire. What did this mean for progress in Europeans over the long term? And even the argument, you know, were Juan Sepulveda and Bartolomeo de las Casas so far off from one another? Sepulveda argued that the uh, natives were inferior and needed to be enslaved. De Las Casas argued that the natives were inferior and needed to be proselytized. So in some ways, they really weren't that far off from each other, and it shows uh, this cultural clash that's taking place that's going to go all the way through imperialism.
This then brings up the transition into slavery, and this is a huge argument to be making with the kids. Um, I like to go back with them at this point and talk about traditional forms of slavery and how this eventually led up to the form of Atlantic slavery. It's going to be so important for this time period. So traditional slavery in Roman Greece was largely due to debt and conquered individuals. Um, after that, the largest slave route that we've ever had that has passed through two continents was the Trans-Saharan slave route from Western Africa into the Caliphates. But then we get the Atlantic slavery. And so one of the questions I like to bring up with the kids, well, if we had these former forms of slavery, and if on top of that, we've actually had a larger form of slavery going from the African uh, continent over into the Middle East, is there anything unique about Atlantic slavery? And I make the argument that there is. The difference has to do with the identity of property. For the first time, slaves are no longer seen as people who have been conquered, who will eventually become part of the family. Rather, they are seen as people who are property, who can then be used, their children can be used, and their grandchildren can be used. Um, this exists within this large trade route, this triangle trade, that involves three continents for the extraction of resources, especially that of sugar. And this is where I like to bring up to the kids the question, you know, why is this the case? Why is it that Atlantic slavery changed the way we looked at human beings? And this really brings up a lot of great arguments that you can have. Um, what I tend to lead to with the kids is that mercantilism provided the context for this. There was a need for cheap labor in order to compete with other European states. And so what Europeans did was they used people from Africa in order to make sure that they would have cheaper, almost no cost labor uh, to compete with other European states. But this also provided very quickly for the beginnings of racism. How do you change human beings into property? You have to dehumanize them. And so this brings up that question, what came first, racism or economics? Um, and there are a lot of ways that you can, you can move with this question off of this. You can talk about how economics led to racism. You can also talk about some of the beginnings of sort of the beliefs that Africans were uncivilized and therefore could be changed into property. So this then leads up to the political revolutions. And I like to argue that, you know, political revolutions really took place in the context of mercantilism and in the context of new ideologies, especially that of the Enlightenment. Of course, the first one being the American Revolution, which was based upon the Enlightenment principle of local representation. After that, the French Revolution takes up that principle and stretches it even further into the notion of, of radical egalitarianism. But then there's a real question that comes up, and it's how far can the Enlightenment go? How far are they going to take the notions of representation, equality, and freedom and apply them really universally, which is what both the American Revolution and the French, French Revolution state they will do, but do they really do this? And of course, that gets into the Haitian Revolution, where we see a huge contradiction in this. In the case of the Haitian Revolution, Haiti was a part of the French and British possessions in the West Indies, producing sugar for the mercantilist system. The Haitians were led by a man named Toussaint Louverture. Uh, Louverture argued uh, that they wanted freedom and they wanted to overturn the race-based system that had been created in Haiti, in which you had the Grand Blancs, uh, the white large plantation owners, and the Petit Blancs, who included both small white plantation owners and some freed slaves. The argument, though, was that slavery should be gotten rid of entirely because of the principles of the French Revolution. However, the French are going to deny this. Originally, they, they actually do agree to this in the French Revolution, but then when Napoleon comes into power, he denies this based upon mercantile interests. And this really hopefully will show the kids that uh, the Enlightenment ideals of universal equality, representation, uh, and opportunities had these underlying uh, contradictions. And that really brings up, again, how do we put these ideas into the context of the economic systems that they were a part of at the time? And what does that mean over the long term um, for the development of progress in Western civilization? Um, so now we run up against the Mesoamerican revolutions. A very similar type of pattern is going to take place, just with some slight differences. In the case of the Mesoamerican revolutions, uh, we had a race and class-based system in Mesoamerica, including the Peninsulares. These were people who were born in Spain and then came over to Mesoamerica. The Creoles, these were people who uh, had been born here in, in Mesoamerica, but they were born of people originally from Spain. And then the natives, uh, people who were here uh, from Mesoamerica the entire time period. Um, we At this time period, we see a revolution that takes place on long Enlightenment ideals in Mexico by a man named Father Miguel Hidalgo. He leads the natives in a revolution that is then 
kind of strangely crushed by the Crayoles. Well, why do I say this is strange? Well, the Crayoles are then going to lead their own revolutions. Uh, the most important, led by a man named Simon Bolivar, he leads the Crayoles and the, and the natives against the Spanish and Portuguese. Now, this brings up again this contradiction. Why is it that the Crayoles will crush a revolution led by Miguel Hidalgo, which was really stressing equality and opportunity and getting rid of race and class-based systems, yet then they have their own revolution. And what I'd like to bring out to the kids is that the reason for this is because the Crayoles saw the Enlightenment as a chance for them to have local power, but their local power only extended so far. So again, there's a major contradiction that's taking place here. It has much more to do with local representation than equality. And so this really allows us to get into some questions about how far did the Enlightenment really go. So now we get to jump into the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, uh, the first big question that takes place here is why did this take place in Great Britain first? There are a number of different theories about this. Um, possible Possibilities are uh, large coal deposits in northern Great Britain. In fact, the Great Britain overall had political st stability unlike within Germany and France where there were a lot of revolutions taking place. And the British provided for huge investments in transportation, especially a railroad system throughout Great Britain. Uh, the major movement of people through urbanization also becomes very important as a pattern as we see more and more people moving off of the farmlands into the cities. And I like to point out that one of the reasons for this, and this is, again is sort of a crossover with AP US history, is the enclosure movement. As people started to realize that they could mass produce crops, there wasn't a need for people to be on the farmland. So a lot of farmers began closing off their land and pushing people off of the land. So those people ended up moving into cities, and then a lot of them moved off in the colonies. So notice we have a, a crossover here now between in the Industrial Revolution and the cities with population, and also the continuation of mercantilism, bringing back raw resources for manufacturing. So this brings up a question. Was industrialism actually a good thing? Well, when I raise this question with the students, you know, I really want them to look at the question of, of is it a net positive, not are there positives and are there negatives, because everything has that. But overall, you know, what is our overall like net gain that we can get from this? Well, one of the main positives we can bring up is that there was an overall rise in living standards over time. You know, one of the common things that's presented that I also present to the students are the horrible living standards that people had to go through in the cities, uh, the horrible types of like tenement apartments, terrible pollution terrible sanitation, uh, poor medical care, um, poor uh, overall working conditions, horrible hours. But at the same time, there was an overall raise in living standards over time. And the reason why is because as people moved out of farmlands in the cities, their absolute rise in, in wealth and in better living standards was rather large. And this was due to the competition and opportunities that industrialism provided. Um, at the same time, I want to give the students a sense that this was not an easy or um, straight line kind of positives, that this included a lot of problems, uh, included the use of child labor. Overall, men were paid about $6 per week. They worked um, about 17 to 19 hours per day, and they worked Monday through Saturday. There was also an increased pollution. This also is not accounting for women getting paid, also working about that time, but getting paid half of what men paid, so about $3 per week, and children being paid about $1.50 per week. Um, we also get into the treatment of child labor within mines and how dangerous that was with, for example, the black lung disease. This then allows us to open up some of those solutions that were offered at this time period that were sort of children of capitalism. So we talk about some of the differences between socialism, Marxism, anarchism, Malthus, and social Darwinism. I also bring up about how there were uh, workers' movements to form unions, and that all of these movements together did form um, some reforms that kind of pushed capitalism in new directions. And so, again, this is not a clear line where it's easy to evaluate that there, was, there were clear positives or clear negatives, but we try to look for what overall was the net positive or net, and net negative that took place. Of course, this does bring up those social Darwinism and the race-based movements of the late 1800s. Um, Herbert Spencer in England developed the idea of races and classes as biological traits. This then traveled over to the U.S., where it was associated with a man named William Graham Sumner. Um, just like to give you one example that I give to the kids that blows them away. Um, at this time period, you know, most people think of racism as sort of um, that kind of like crazy, irrational belief of groups like the KKK and so forth. I like to point out to the students that racism has taken on numerous different uh, ways and methods, and this is why it has been such a dangerous idea for so long. 
Um, racism has been what we call scientific racism, in which in the late 1800s, scientific reports were formed that supposedly demonstrated the inferiority or superiority of races. Uh, one absurd example of this was these scientists took the cadavers of men of different um, supposed racial backgrounds, took their brains and filled them with mustard seeds, shook them up, poured them out, and the brain that could hold the most amount of mustard seeds was seen as the superior brain. Um, they used this to create massive charts and tables and scientific reports that seem to give credibility to these types of racist notions. And while today we look back on this and, and thank goodness know how morally bankrupt and scientifically bankrupt these theories are, the point is science was able to provide this background and this credibility to scientific theories about racism at the time period. And that really is going to provide for a connection to imperialism and then eventually the rise of 20th century genocides. So that allows us now to get into European imperialism. Uh, Britain noted in the late 1800s that it had an imbalance of trade with China. So it used opium wars to force open China to trade to try and stop that imbalance. Um, Britain also ended up creating a dependent state in India using tariffs. And France and Britain used a variety of what are called direct and indirect controls, pitting internal classes against each other. So France tended to be the one to use direct control. They would have a military leader within the colony uh, where they would take direct control. Uh, Britain used the people in the local area. They moved middle class people into governmental positions, and they would typically have one military leader overseeing this. Um, the reason why this worked out so well for Great Britain is that the middle class in these different countries typically wanted their independence, but they didn't want it to happen too quick because they needed British help and support. So like, for example, the Indian National Congress or the African National Congress, both of these areas uh, tended to push for independence, but not quick enough. And in fact, this led to, in the 20th century, leaders like Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela, who eventually became so disenchanted uh, with their middle class groups who weren't pushing quickly enough for nationalist movements. Scramble for Africa. Um, Otto von Bismarck created the Berlin Conference to organize the breakup of Africa. Um, Europe was, at this time period, you know, one of the mistakes a lot of students make is that they think that Europe had always been able to imperialize Africa. They really weren't. Uh, Europe did a great job of controlling sort of the coastlines, but they could not get into the middle part of Africa until the late 1800s. They're able to do it at that point because of the Industrial Revolution. They were able to have mechanized weapons, railroads, and medicine, especially quinine, and that's going to allow them to get in to partition out Africa. Uh, the local indigenous response was generally around traditional religious beliefs. Um, they tried to organize a strong state control and their traditions to try and uh, battle back the Europeans, but eventually were unsuccessful in doing so. The opposite side of the world, there was also a response to this through Asian imperialism. Um, Commodore Perry from the United States forced open Japan's Tokugawa regime, which had been isolated for centuries. Uh, Japan responded by moving their daimyo, their governors, into cities and creating a parliament. Uh, the parliament that they created, though, and I like to point this out to the students, the parliament was not a democratic parliament like in the West. Japan's emperor grew in power and centralized his influence. The parliament was then used as advisors, not as a, as a democracy. Notice here, I don't know if you see the connection here, but this goes back to the traditional Asian beliefs, very similar to Chinese legalism. And so I like to point out to them that what we're seeing here is a mixture uh, within Japan, both of Western technology, but Asian culture of Confucianism and Chinese legalism. So this brings up the question, you know, why was Japan able to do this, but China wasn't? And the argument that I make here is that China attempted to. Uh, there was an attempt after the Opium Wars. Uh, China had what was called the self-strengthening movement that suggested modernization. The most important is a slogan called East for Essence, West for Practical Use. The idea being that China would bring back Western technology while at the same time period maintaining their Confucian beliefs. However, uh, for China, China eventually, their Confucianists rejected this effort. Um, China decided to remain Confucianist and to remain agricultural. Uh, the eventual consequence of that was China did not industrialize, and it was eventually conquered by Japan, who did industrialize in the Sino-Japanese War. So, what are the themes that we can take out of this time period? Um, Europe is going to become dominant as it borrows or steals and implements new technologies in the competition of its nation-states. Political revolutions are going to break up the empires into nation-states that are based upon local elite representation.
The Industrial Revolution changes economics to internal competition for mass production in cities. The Europeans are going to use imperialism to extract resources for industrialization, and local populations agree to modernize, but they try to hold on to their traditional beliefs in response to European imperialism. Some possible questions you might want to think about for comparison and contrast possibilities are to analyze the similarities and differences between countries' reactions to the Industrial Revolution. This is a great opportunity for the kids to look at India, to look at Japan and China and Africa. How did they respond to the Europeans' efforts to try to control them? Uh, there's also a good change in continuity here. How did the developing world countries both change and remain the same in their economic and social organization when in contact with the Europeans? So this is a great opportunity for the kids to see that uh, the uh, developing world was not a world that was static or that was victimized, but rather it was a world that was in relationship with the Europeans. Um, and it depends upon the area of the world that we're talking about. Uh, you can talk about how Japan mixed together Eastern ideas and Western technology. China decided to remain traditional. Mesoamerica tried to fight for a local representation. There are a lot of possibilities here to talk about what the changes were, but also what the continuities were uh, in this development and competition with the Europeans. So I hope this takes a very complex time period and provides some possibilities for you to think about content and skills wise for what you might be able to teach. And this of course leads us up to probably one of the most complex parts of the class and that's the end of the class which is the 20th century which we'll get into next week. Thanks and looking forward to talking to you um, on Canvas.